Hey, engineering students. So here we are once again with a video for you guys to watch. Just to prep you on some things that are coming up. This is going to be one of the last-ish kind of videos for the year, actually. There won't be too many more. It won't be video-driven. I'm going to release an assignment to you um, very soon, which has all of the details about how this last quarter is going to look. What does the Mars Rover project look like? How do you do that? Um, what do I expect of you? How am I going to grade it? How do you work in a team and get it all together? It's going to be really cool, suffice to say. We're also going to keep on uh, looking at Mr. Mitchell's project in the background as well as we go. And uh, so, yeah, don't, don't forget about that one. So this video is going to give you some idea about what the Mars Rover program is and has been and is going in be into the future. Uh, lots of information that you can actually use to incorporate into your design. Just to give you a little taste of it up front, here are the rovers, and I'll have to move my camera here for a second because there's the name. Here are the rovers that have gone out before the one that just landed about a month ago. We, uh, we, we, like the humans, um, in the America, I should be specific too, because there have been Chinese rovers, but America started with the Sojourner back in 97. There were two identical, like sister rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, that went out in 2004. And then there's Curiosity in 2012. I'll get to the most recent one soon. It looks a lot like Curiosity. Uh, the design was absolutely based on that. Um, and there's some people there staying there for effect, pretending to talk friendly to each other, talking nerdy stuff. And I don't think they're staying on the surface of Mars. So every time they send up one of these rovers, they have like a little um, duplicate back home, which they use to do training and see how it's going to work and all those all those kind of things uh, to put on display. And I think I think you guys, you guys probably know all that. Now, before I go any deeper into this, we are going to take a little switch over and I want to show you uh, the load test that we ran on Mrs. Jones' standing desk before we delivered it to her. Uh, there's some important justification of results here and so we'll switch over that. It'll just be a few minutes and then we'll come straight back onto the main show. Engineering students, I just wanted to go over one more thing with Mrs. Jones' desk before I deliver it to her today. I know you guys saw this already. We took a photo. Uh, thanks again to Zach for making the tabletop. Thank you to all of you for designing this. I can't give this to her without running an actual check on the numbers that you guys did back in, I think it was January, um, where we calculated what would be the actual uh, tipping force required to bump this thing over, okay? Like what is the moment that we would need to generate to make it tip over. Like what if a kid pushes down, if she is sitting here like this with her chair and just working naturally, what's gonna happen? So you guys did this, you all did this, and we said that this situation right now, uh, let's just get a quick close up shot. This is what we were talking about, if you remember, with the caster wheels being in this particular position. You know, caster wheels can roll in any direction. So we said, this right there is the safest position because the, the pivot point is the furthest that way. Now, when we calculated that at the time, we said that for this position nine inches in from the end, which is like the exact halfway of this section, we said that would be 54 pounds, which is about the weight of a small child. She can sit here, she can lean with the weight of a small child, and then you see at some point it does tip up. And then we calculated at the very extreme edge, this is like if someone, worst case scenario, tries to sit on it or push down, we said 28.9 pounds. Okay, 54, 28.9. Now we changed, I changed, a lot of parts of the design as we went along. There were some aspects of it that uh, just had to be adjusted, but we will measure this right now and we'll see how close we get. We have our cool digital force scale here. Um, I'm going to turn on the units to pounds and I'm going to turn on the peak mode so it captures the highest thing that is going to happen. Now, uh, I don't know if we can get a little closer here so we can see the numbers that are coming up. Let me push down at this point and we'll see exactly what we get when it's just like this. I'm just going to lean on it. 
nice and slowly. And there it goes. Okay, 47. A little lower than the 54. Let's try another one as well. We like to do this a few times so we get an average result. All right, right here. Wheels are in good position. Here we go. All right, 48. So this is uh, roughly about 10% different than our actual theoretical estimate. We had 54 pounds, we got around 47, 48. That's about 10% off. When I did, was doing other tests earlier as well, I was going as high as 54. It was never any bigger than that, but it's absolutely within that range. And that's actually a spectacular result. Like to be within 10% of what you predict for this kind of like, you know, backyard school level stuff is very, very good. Now let's test as well over in the extreme position right here. Again, this was uh, 28.9, let's say 29 pounds is roughly what we should be expecting over here. Are we on peak? No, we're not. Peak mode, here we go. And there it goes. We got 24.2 pounds, I'll do that one more time. moment now 24.1 pounds okay so again compare that to the, to the 28.9 that again is about roughly like you know uh, that's a little more than 10% than less but very close to it um, in our original design the one we were calculating here we actually had a big wooden panel right here uh, which we no longer have with this design we abandoned I I did this I abandoned the back part here that was originally part of it because um, this seemed like a cleaner, more simple design. Now, a uh, question for you. When this is raised up, it goes up and down, obviously. When this is raised right up, is there any real change? Look how strong that is. Is there any real change to what the tipping moment would be? Will that affect it at all? You should know the answer because you're an engineering student. If you said the answer is no change, then you are correct. So let's see if the theory and the practice match up. I got about 40 that time. It's actually a little teeny bit less, huh? Um, that shouldn't change because we didn't change uh, the length of the moment arm. Okay, we're still pressing down, we're still getting a force times a perpendicular distance. We didn't change the moment arm. So it should be the same in theory, um, but there we go. So thank you again, guys, for building this. Uh, Zach, thanks for painting some of this, Unhell, and I'll be delivering this today, and we'll send you a video of that as well. Thanks very much. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed that. Um, she was, of course, delighted to receive that, and we're going to put up a blog article about that very soon. So back to the rovers. Here's the first one, Sojourner. Let's uh, just run through some basic information about this one. This is the little uh, little little puppy dog of them all. See the little solar panel there, little six six wheels. This one it really was about the size of a medium dog. Okay, 25 pounds. You can easily pick this thing up and and uh, heft it around. When you get to Mars, that goes down to 10 pounds. So uh, the quicker among you will work out that is about 40% of Earth's gravity. This thing was meant to just drive around for seven days. They call them souls, by the way, S-O-L. Uh, seven Martian days, but it went for 83, which is great. That is a lot more. It only went about 100 meters. If you're picturing these things like, you know, leaping off the, off the red sand dunes at high speed, that is not what is happening. These things bumble around very slowly and cautiously. It had a 15 watt solar panel. <clears throat> um, that's, you know, a little more than your pocket calculator has if it's solar powered, but not much more. 15 watts is very, very gentle. There was a lander that came down, the Pathfinder lander, uh, that had a parachute and airbags kind of down to the surface and 
uh, unfolded and then Sojourner rolled out and went away. I think it's been a while since I saw the Martian, but I think I think he's he finds the Pathfinder lander. Does he use that to communicate? Uh, I think it might be the case. Oh, okay. There you go. I actually wrote this slideshow about five years ago and I just updated it. The rover was controlled by a person wearing 3D goggles and a tracking ball. Even back in 97, I guess we had 3D goggles and tracking balls. Here's the next one. Uh, as I said, this was a pair of uh, sisters, twin sisters, I guess we could call them, in 2004, Spirit and Opportunity. A lot of similarities you can see, but we're getting bigger, still with the six wheels, um, still with the solar power. Uh, now it looks like a little bit crossed with the short circuit robot. There's a little, little mast with the cameras and stuff. This one was about 400 pounds. A little harder to lift, a little hard to bench press. But on Mars, maybe you could. If you can lift 160 pounds, many of you probably can. You could, you could do it. This one was meant to go for 90 Martian days, but it survived for Sorry, the one of them survived for 2,208. So you see NASA's got a pretty good track record at exceeding uh, what they aim for, it seems. Opportunity, when I last had this slideshow five years ago, Opportunity was still driving around. And I think the count was like, uh, what was it, like 3,000 Martian days. I updated this slideshow now. It died not too long ago, uh, but it went for 5,111 days. If you can ever design something which lasts 57 times as long as what it is supposed to, like it was something like four years longer than it was supposed to, it was something huge. Um, that's very, very good. Okay, so they got a lot more mileage than they ever expected. Speaking of mileage, um, I believe this was Opportunity went for, um, oh, there we go. Spirit went that far. Opportunity went that far. Uh, 42 and a half kilometers. So it, it exceeded a marathon. Spirit did get stuck in soft soil. That's why it died. But um, opportunity, oh, there you go. Let's keep talking Spirit. Um, 256 meg of memory. That is laughable. Like my laptop, I think, has 128 gigabytes. Um, and that's not really that much. Um, 500, you know, terabytes is not uncommon on a, on a laptop computer. So this thing was really like a sign of its times. On day 17, I love this, the hard drive had too many files, so they'd delete some to get it working again. Now, Opportunity got stuck as well, um, but after six weeks of careful maneuvering, can you imagine that? You're stuck in the sand and you're just wriggling slowly. Out. And I mean, I mean slowly. These things just go at a snail's pace, but through careful, like, you know, wiggling and everything, it was able to get out. Uh, this thing, they ran it very cautiously. When a dust storm would come through, they'd like close it up and then open it up again. Um, they really got the longevity out of it, and that's how it that's how it went. And there you go, 28 miles again. And then uh, here's the bigger one, at least at this time. Curiosity in 2012. It lands in 2012, that is. This one was the weight of a small car. And again, I think we often think of rovers as being little small things like, like the very first one, but this one, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Um, it could run you down if it could catch you. It would never catch you. Very slow. This one also um, was meant to go for 668 Martian days, but as of right now, it is still driving around there. That, that 3,075 days probably needs to be updated by the time you watch this video. You can look at the Wikipedia page. It is running. Um, that landing is very different. This thing is what they call the seven minutes of terror. Uh, if you toured the JPL, you might have seen a little video on that. I'm going to show you something in just a second. But there is a 14-minute delay in the signal travel between Mars and Earth because that's you know, how fast light travels. Information can only travel at the speed of light. Radio waves travel at the speed of light because they're on the electromagnetic spectrum. So if it takes you seven minutes to get through the atmosphere, but there's a 14 minute delay in the signal travel, then your rover is already either landed or not by the time you learn about it. It's a little like how, you know, they always say the stars in the sky, they could have exploded last year. We wouldn't know about it yet. The nearest star is about four and a half light years away, Alpha Centauri. We wouldn't know for four and a half years 
if something had happened to it. Uh, this rover, Curiosity, has gone about 15 miles, so not actually as far as the previous one. And here's the video um, about the seven minutes of terror. We'll see if this plays properly. Here we go. When people look at it, uh, it looks crazy. Lots That's a very natural dramatic thing. lighting. Sometimes when we look at it, it looks crazy. It is the result of reasoned engineering thought. Wow. But it still looks crazy. From the top of the atmosphere, down to the surface, it takes us seven minutes. It takes 14 minutes or so for the signal from the spacecraft to make it to Earth. That's see the how signal. far Mars is see away. See the signal going to Earth. So when we first get word Just arrived. that we've touched the top of the atmosphere, the vehicle has been alive or dead on the surface for at least seven minutes. Entry, descent, and landing, also known as EDL, to refer to as a seven minutes of terror, because we've got literally seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere to the surface of Mars, going from 13,000 miles an hour to zero in perfect sequence, perfect choreography, perfect timing, and the computer has to do it all by itself with no help from the ground. Wow. It, if any one thing doesn't work just right, it's game over slam into the atmosphere and develop so much aerodynamic drag. Our heat shield, it heats up and it glows like the surface of the sun. 1,600 degrees. During entry, the vehicle is not only slowing down violently through the atmosphere, but also we are guiding it like an airplane to be able to land in a very narrow constraint space. This is one of the biggest challenges that we are facing and one that we have never attempted on Mars. Mars is actually really hard to slow down because it has just enough atmosphere that you have to deal with it. Otherwise, it will destroy your spacecraft. On the other hand, it doesn't have enough atmosphere to finish the job. We're still going about 1,000 miles an hour. So at that point, we use a parachute. The parachute is the largest and strongest supersonic parachute that we've ever built to date. It has to be able to withstand 65,000 pounds of force, even though the parachute itself only weighs about 100 pounds. When it opens up that fast, it's a neck snapping nine Gs. At that That's point, nine times the acceleration of gravity. The lens cap blocking our view of the ground to the radar. The radar has to take just the right altitude and velocity measurements at just the right time, or the rest of the landing sequence won't work. This big, huge parachute that we've got, it'll only slow us down to about 200 miles an hour. And that's not slow enough to land. So we have no choice, but we've got to cut it off Ooh. and come down on rockets. Once we turn those rocket motors on, if we don't do something, we're just going to smack right back into the parachute. So the first thing we do is make this really radical diverting maneuver. We fly off to the side, diverting away from the parachute, this is awesome. killing our horizontal velocity and our vertical velocity, getting the rover moving straight up and down so it can look at the surface with its radar and see where we're going to land. Then we head straight down to the bottom of a crater, right beside a six-kilometer high mountain. A big mountain. We can't get those rocket engines too close to the ground because if we were to descend propulsively with our engines all the way to the ground, we would essentially create this massive dust cloud. That dust cloud could then go and land on the rover. It could damage mechanisms and it could damage instruments. So the way we solve that problem is by using the sky cramp of the rover. 20 meters above the surface, we have to lower the rover below us on a tether that's 21 feet long and then gently deposit it on its wheels, on the surface. That's absolutely incredible. Touches down and is now on the ground. The descent stage 
It's a collision course with a rope. You must cut the bridle immediately and fly to the same stage to a safe distance from the road. Oh man, I love that. Okay, August 5th, 2012, that's when it landed. So yeah, it's been up there for what, nine years or so? That's pretty cool. It made it, it made it, it worked. Um, that's just incredible. They, they hover above with those rockets while they lower it. Man, I guess it helps that uh, gravity is only 40%, but the atmosphere, 1%, crazy stuff. Okay, uh, we're now gonna switch over again. We have another little mini segment here for you. Uh, I thought with all this NASA stuff, all these rovers, we need to talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. So let's go over there and talk to her and then we'll come back after that. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick little pause from the main lesson here. And I want to talk to uh, your favorite Miss Romero. Here mm -hmm. she is. We are talking about space exploration. Um, and right now we are as an engineering team about to start this Mars rover project. So um, they're going to be building, designing a fairly big Mars rover with lots of different pieces that the different teams are going to do. Then they will integrate it into one whole and then we'll run it through like a mission right here on campus. So, oh, wow. so pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit like what is happening right now on Mars. It's, it's up there. Um, Perseverance is up there and driving around, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any photos? Have you checked out the website lately? Uh, I've seen like photos of like the little tires. And yeah, exactly. Them and stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's really fun. I was looking at it the other day and I, I recommend checking in. They have photo of the week that they put up oh, there. Okay. And yeah, they're, they're really good. Mm -hmm. um, quick little recap. Many of you who are watching this went to JPL with us. Uh, this was in, I think, September, perhaps, of 2019. And that was very memorable for me. What was your favorite moment on that tour? What's the standout? The standout has got to be where we saw the Mars, yeah. when it was called Mars 2020. Right, they hadn't named it yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. rover being worked on. Yeah. That was just amazing. I know, it was great. Um, I remember seeing the like black kind of guitar case and mm -hmm. the, the uh, drone was, was in there. The drone is called Ingenuity, and um, yeah, they're going to take that for a test flight pretty soon, mm -hmm. which I don't know how they're doing that. They say the atmosphere is 1% of the density of Earth's. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you even generate lift when the air is that thin, but they say they're going to do yeah. it. So, so we'll see. Yeah, see. We'll see. Now, I, I have uh, Ms. Romero here because she was a NASA intern. Uh, she is obviously teaching mathematics. She's uh, completely gone down that path. So when it came to being a NASA intern, uh, most people will never do that, have never done mm -hmm. that. That's a pretty unique thing. How did that come to be? Yeah, I was in the final stretch of my grad school program at CSU Channel Islands. And yeah. uh, I was looking for possibilities of where I wanted to take my career. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that I worked on was for my thesis was a space exploration related okay. thesis. And I figured I might want to apply to a NASA internship. They yeah. do accept graduates um, yeah. right out of school and um, for those internships. And I decided to apply. Yeah. I looked at some positions that I was interested in that were math related yeah. and went ahead and applied. Yeah. I did the whole waiting game and after I think two months had to wait. I got a, just an email from a NASA geologist wanting to interview me. Okay. And I was like, is this real? Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And then I did the phone call. He pretty much offered me the position on the spot. Yeah. Okay. And he just needed to send over the paperwork. And uh, I wasn't expecting to move out to Huntsville, Alabama. I knew nothing about Huntsville, Alabama. Okay. And uh, I really enjoyed the experience. There's so much greenery, so many like oh, okay. space exploration professionals. Yeah. And it was amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. How old were you at this time? I was like 24. Yeah, okay. So still, still pretty early days in yeah. a person's life. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. Um, how long was the internship for? It was 16 weeks. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. 
And what do they have you doing? So um, I was working with a geologist that had a lunar regolith samples. Okay, which is rocks, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, broken like fragments, fragments from rock. the rock. Yeah. And uh, they also had lunar um, regolith uh, simulant samples. What does that mean? So the simulants are like just the substance, like broken rock. Okay. that they use so that they can uh, test um, anything that they're sending out in space that isn't the actual lunar regolith, but it mimics like the properties okay. of the lunar that's, regolith. That's what it sounds like. It's a, it's a simulated mm -hmm. lunar rock. Okay. Yes. Okay. Right. So uh, from there, he wanted to be able to determine how many particles is necessary to... Um, so how many particles from the substance mm -hmm. would be necessary to accurately um, be representative of a population? Right, like tell you the composition of the rock and the facts about it. Mm -hmm. Like how much do you need before it becomes valid? Yes. Yeah, okay, wow. And I was handed a hard drive with uh -huh. imagery of the lunar regolith simulants. Okay. And uh, we wanted to extract uh, several measurements of the particles so think thousands of images, yeah. thousands of particles. Yeah. I was not going to do that with a ruler and pen right. and paper. Right. So what I did was I wrote a code in MATLAB for it to read in all of the images mm -hmm. and in the end extract all of the measurements that we were looking for. Yeah. So from there, did some data analysis, compared yeah. all the samples, uh, sample particle measurements, I should yeah. say and uh, came up with the conclusion that we needed more than 10,000 particle <laughs> okay. measurements to be able to say like, this sample would be representative of the population. Got it, so you found the outcome and you did it through coding, is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, that's wow. what I'm okay. And algebra, there's uh, and algebra, yeah, wow. particle size, yeah. uh, area, perimeter. Yeah. So yeah. you found a practical use for mathematics. Yeah, wow, I did. In incredible. everyday life. It's almost like we teach it <laughs> for a reason, right? Yeah, that's cool. So uh, you guys know, obviously, we just finished our unit on coding. Um, <clears throat> we had the students working exclusively in Python, all mm -hmm. of them. And um, we finished, I, I don't know if you know this, but we finished our, I guess it was four weeks of study with an RPG text-based game. Like in the, I, the yeah, adventure I, game. I heard the freshmen, yeah, yeah, playing their games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You have to see. Um, I I named three. I said Nolan Lungard had a uh, really good uh, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure themed game. Oh, okay. Um, Davis had a Dungeons and Dragons style one, and then Isaiah had a Mandalorian one, which I oh, know wow. you'd be interested. Yeah, in. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I'm gonna play those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Good. So coding important. <laughs> Math important. Um, I, I think it's all hugely fascinating and I I just love hearing the story and this, this shows you what you guys can actually do and accomplish and sometimes it comes to you unexpectedly you know you, you send an email you get an email back and then there it is like life takes this little, little direction mm -hmm. um, that's very much how it was for me as well actually um, when I went and did my engineering internship after four years of study uh, it just took my life down this whole whole other path that I wasn't expecting and it was just yeah an email here an email back mm -hmm. and then you, you decide if you walk through that door or not and that's it's kind of fun it's an adventure and um, yeah I think engineers and scientists and mathematicians are actually really well poised to do that kind of thing mm -hmm. as people want those skills uh, more than ever um, I'm sure that you have been watching things like uh, SpaceX and Amazon as well as NASA you know, we have these private companies now that are doing these incredible things, like they're launching rockets up, having them land back on the pad. Um, they are talking about wanting to build Mars colonies, like, you know, in the next decade, like have people living permanently on the moon, on, sorry, on, on Mars, on the moon. Um, what do you think about all this? Like, this is a whole, whole sphere of activity in industry, which has never really existed except in science fiction that we're on on the threshold of that right now so what do you think about all of that like the the value of it the the purpose of it any any thoughts at all mm -hmm. 
I think it's exciting. I think it talks to or speaks to the just human spirit and sense of adventure and uh, wanting to explore since uh, humans took to the seas and wanting to discover new lands. Yeah. Um, now we're taking to the skies yeah. and wanting to explore further. And I think with that, we're able to learn about ourselves and our planet and the universe that we live in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just learn, learning more and more. Just mm -hmm. more science, more knowledge. Yeah, no, I think I think it's a good thing. Um, as we wrap up this little segment here, I just want to get from you some advice. So we have students who have made a choice to join in with this engineering academy. They have uh, stronger math skills, stronger science skills, stronger problem solving, teamwork skills. And I don't know if you guys even realize just how much you've received in this regard um, beyond what is typical. It's, it's been a, a gift too. So as they look into their futures and their careers, like what is their trajectory, what would you say as someone who's a little bit older, a little further down the path, you know, um, what kind of advice would you give to our, our engineering students? The first thing I would say is uh, seek a good mentor, someone that you're able to come to and rely on trust and go to for advice. Mm. The second thing is take that leap of faith. Like you don't know where it's going mm. to lead to. Had I not just done a simple application, I would yeah. not have thought to be NASA engineer. Yeah. So yeah. There you go. Take the chances. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ms. Mira. We'll leave it there and thank we you. will go back to our, our main presentation. <laughs> All right, I hope you enjoyed that little diversion there. Um, it was great to hear more about what Ms. Romero has experienced, and I hope that you feel a little bit of that that uh, energy of uh, you know possibilities and aspirations. All right, let's go on now to the actual current one, the the uh, the one that we all want to know about. This is the room, I, I think. I think I remember those badges on the wall there. Um, we talked about the JPL trip in that uh, previous segment. That's the room we were looking at, as far as I can tell, up up in the glass. Uh, this is the 2021 rover. It launched in, sorry, 20, what am I trying to say? It launched in 2020. It touched down uh, right now in 2021. Perseverance, or if you're very British, you might say perseverance. And um, you can see it is clearly based on the previous design. Like I said, it's a little little heftier, actually, a little bit bigger. Um, it is like, I uh, forget what that is. It was like 100 kilos heavier or so because um, they did pack it out with some slightly different equipment. I see it still has, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but up at the top left of the rover is the exact same kind of thing that was on the previous one, the Curiosity one. It's this little uh, like thermonuclear reactor, which is just like decomposing plutonium, which I think is heating up water, which is powering the thing. Um, no more solar panels for this guy. We want power all the time on demand. And that's how they solved that issue. They were, they were sick of, of having like dirty solar panels, sick of not having enough power. We just make our own power now. This one has been on Mars for about a month. Okay, it landed in February. It is March. Well, it might be March by the time you watch this. It has so far driven a tremendous 190 meters. That's not a great deal. That's like 500 feet ish. Um, so it's just just kind of just kind of getting started, but it goes it goes pretty slow. And the mission is to look for habitability. This is a very like like biological focused mission. They're, they're not making any um, any hiding that fact. And say so like, yeah, we are looking for signs of life out there. We want to know all those questions. Like, are we alone? Are there any biosignatures? Has life ever existed, let alone exist now? Do we see any, any evidence of that? So there's a lot of sample collecting, okay? Um, they're testing to see if you can make oxygen easily. There's a little oxygen production uh, module, I guess, on board. And that is absolutely with a view to making a colony on Mars because you got to have air to breathe because us humans like the air. Uh, one of the cool things we'll look at in this uh, in this presentation is there's a drone on the bottom, Ingenuity. And this was kind of cool because last year when we went to the JPL laboratory, that's redundant, I know, 
uh, we were building and flying a six-bladed drone, a hexacopter. So that was a, a cool little tie-in for us. And actually, before I go to that, it's really tough to launch that drone. Like, like, like you saw in the, the seven minutes of terror video, the atmosphere is 1%, one hundredth of Earth's. So how do you have a drone beating down the air? I'm not even sure. This drone doesn't have anything on board except one camera. I think it's one camera. They're going to fly it. And it's really just like to see if we can do this. That's that's the whole point. We're just going to see if we can fly a drone around. Is this a way that we can navigate another world? It'll be the first powered flight on another world. That's cool. And I noticed they say the first powered flight. I wonder if there have been gliders, maybe? I'm not quite sure. There is a uh, 2.1 meter robotic arm that's uh, about seven feet long and that has a little rock coring device it drills down and then it stores little little samples of the rock they describe it as being about the size of a piece of chalk uh, like I said nuclear powered like curiosity okay now I'm just going to throw some cool photos at you so this is um on board the rover this is like the family photos you got Sojourner, Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, Perseverance, and then Ingenuity flying around. I think those words are added to the image. I don't think they're on the image itself. Oh, here we go. Here's a little more detail about um, what is all on board. And I want you to watch this closely because you're doing your rover. So you might get some ideas here. You've got cameras everywhere. Um, Sherlock Watson, I don't even know what that is. That must be the rock drilling device there. Um, a micro context camera. I think that's just like a, almost like a microscope, but not really a microscope. 23 cameras in all. Um, some of those devoted to the entry, descent and landing. That's pretty cool. Um, your rover, by the way, is going to have two cameras, if I can find them both, and they're both working still after the last crash. Um, one will be on the drone that you will release, and one will be on the robot itself. Uh, they call it the mast cam. There's several of them. They use these to assemble like composite images um, of the landscape around, like 3D uh, images, and you'll see some of those in a second. This is pretty important. This is um, the way that the uh, thing drives. You would have noticed this design on on both of the, actually maybe even Spirit and Opportunity, I think might have had this. This is the rocker bogey system. Apparently it works pretty well because they keep using it. Each of the six wheels has its own little motor. Um, the two front and ba two back wheels can both steer. And like when I say steer, I mean like actually like, like rotate side to side. Um, and this is really low. So these motors are geared up to get the max torque. Speed is just not an issue. We're not worried about it. We're all about torque. We don't want to get stuck in the sand because that ruins the whole mission. And you notice how, how easily this system just like slips over the obstacles in its path. By the way, the faded one in the background would be like the rear one, showing that even if the two wheels are not running simultaneously over similar obstacles that they can be over different obstacles it'll still handle it pretty well and the center body is kind of hanging if you like between them on axles independent axles so it can sort of just roll with it and do what it needs to do no springs no shock absorbers that is a lot of extra weight and you need that kind of thing on like cars and uh, you know like the if you've seen pictures of the the moon rover that the, the guys were like driving around on the moon i think that probably had springs and shock absorbers otherwise you just shake your poor little thing to pieces um this thing can even climb over small vertical obstacles i'm guessing pretty small probably like in the order of a foot or so but um yeah i i don't know if the joints are motorized i don't think they are i think all of the motorization is purely in the wheels but uh, if you have enough torque, you can just, just like drive your way up over. All right, here's a little close-up picture of the Ingenuity drone. You can 
see it is just a box with some legs and two blades. The two blades are going to rotate uh, opposite to each other so that the thing doesn't spin around um, in one direction like a helicopter would if the back rotor got damaged. And here's a cool image of how this thing was dropped off. These images are like just a week or two old, depending on when you watch this video. But you see that guitar-shaped case underneath? It just drops that down, probably with our explosive bolts, and then it drives along to get away from that, and then it kind of whoop, just sort of folds and flops down. Um, one side of the legs are pre-folded up, and so when it gets down, they just flop all the way down, and then that's going to be whoop, released, and it's going to drop right down, and there you go. The rover will drive a safe distance away, and then it's going to fly. It's got a 30-day window to make its first flight. So that's going to be happening really soon. Um, it only has enough power to like fly a short distance. I think it's got solar panels to recharge. I'm guessing, knowing NASA, they're going to get more out of it than what they have designed for. You know, just uh, under promise, over deliver. I got that right. Here are some photos of the rover. Uh, this could generate some conspiracy theories. How do they take a photo of the rover? Was someone staying nearby? No, this is with the mast cam. They've reassembled images, probably like artificially blanked out the mast cam using that. Um, and if you can't really see it very well, but right where my cursor is, there's a little drilled hole right there in the rock. It has already drilled its first sample and extracted it. It's doing its thing. Some more images. This is uh, the arm, I believe, just going through some motions, just checking what will happen. Look how dusty it all is. A lot of dust. That would be the prime problem on this mission, at least after you land. How do you deal with a lot of dust? Dust kills everything. And there is an image of what it looked like from the sky crane with those rocket jets burning as it lowered it down to the surface. That's really cool. They just, remember, they saw all these images after it all happened. You're not getting this live. It's already landed or destroyed. So if you want more information, you go to mars.nasa.gov. I hope this gives you some excitement and good background for the, the uh, project you'll do for the rest of this quarter. Keep an eye on Google Classroom. All the details are coming out there. This is your class. Make the most of it. Thanks, guys. We'll see you around.